you know, this is our Saturday plan. So I'm going to talk about how we grade our, our, our previous game, how we review our goals from our previous game, and also take a look at our self-scout, which we do, you know, typically every two to, to four weeks, depending on where we are at, at our season and how we use that self-scout to inform, you know, our decisions moving forward into the next phases of our season. So the first thing we're talking about is our Saturday feedback. Uh, typically, we're going to do this in three different ways. Uh, so what we're doing is typically we're going to do what's called a 111th grade. I'll explain to you what that is in a second. Um, how we go and annotate our notes and huddle and also our offensive goal tracker that we use to track our four major goals for the season. So the first part is our 111th grade. So what it is, is each position is going to grade, you know, their position group, each player within their position group on a two point scale. Uh, one point is going to be for outcome based. So did you accomplish your job? Did you do what you're supposed to do on the play? And the second point is going to be for the process. So, you know, for a quarterback, did you make the right read? Did you use your right footwork? Is there a technique flaw that we could fix? So this is your chance to, to grade them on some things that are going to be process oriented to get, get them to be successful down the road. And also, you know, be outcome oriented. You know, you can be perfect on your process, but not get the job done. So, you know, we grade it on those two point scales right there. And then also within the huddle notes, you know, we, we take a look and, and use that as an opportunity to try to grade as much as we can and have this kids see it before we even come in on our meetings on, on, on a Monday. And we don't bring our kids in on the weekends. Um, typically, our kids are coming from all over the place. And with a long season, um, we just feel like it's best in our interest, in our situation, uh, to not meet on Saturdays. Half the times I'm scrambling on Saturdays to try to get ready for our meetings. So I felt like it was better off, and our, our team feels like it's better off to meet on Monday and go through the game review on that day. So here's what our 111th grade looks like. So typically what we do is we take a look at um, – this is all pulled from huddle. So – Typically, you're going to set up your columns in huddle to include, like, the play name, um, the result of the play, how many yards you gain, the down and distance in those situations. And then these vertical columns are the grade for each player. So this is number 16, number 43, number 49. And these are their grades for each play that they're in. So if you look at the columns right here, this is basically how each player performed throughout the game. And if you look at the rows, this is how each play actually performed throughout the game. So you can see – uh, I color coded it. So bright green plays like this, 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 those are plays all over 90%. Those are our A grade plays. So phenomenal stuff there. Our darker greens going to be our B plays. Our whites will be our C plays and our reds will be our D's and our F's. So on the rows, you can see how each play performed and you can get an idea of how each player is responsible for doing their job and how that affects the outcome. So you can see, you know, even if plays grade, you know, in the 80s or 90s, if one person, you know, doesn't do their 111, doesn't do their job, it, how it can affect the whole outcome of the play. So this is a, a graphic that we give our kids on Monday, and they can take a look at uh, to really see what their grade is and how it affected the play and also how, you know, we performed as a team. So you can see here, we do the math and the equations to set it up to where this is our, our game grade, how we perform for that day. So that is um, what we do for uh, our individual and team grades. Um, so really all you do is just create the columns, export it to Excel, and then you do the math on it and then, um, color code it there. So if you guys have questions, I can take it offline. I can teach you guys how to run through that. Uh, next things we, we take our chances on huddle to, uh, try to annotate and try to give ourselves as much feedback as possible. Um, you know, we expect our kids, even though they're not coming in, you have to watch the film on, on Sunday or Monday before you come into your meetings. That way we're not spending the entire meeting, just watching and reviewing the previous game. Um, you know, there have been weeks where, you know, we have watched a lot more of the week, last week's game if it was something we could really learn from. But um, I think you can really prove your point by just really refining how many clips you show the previous game. I think you can maximize your time a little bit better and, um, you know, really prove the point across. If they're making the same mistake, show one or two clips of it, and then you've proved your point, and then kind of the same mistakes over, and you'll address that in practice and, and everything else as you move forward. All right, this next page here is our offensive goal tracker. So these are the four goals that we track throughout the season. And I've done this uh, since 2013. I originally got this from uh, my good friend, Patrick Walsh, in Sarah High School in Northern California. Uh, there are four goals to measure four things. So typically, um, the first goal, 1.7 first downs per drive. Uh, we're looking to see if we can drive the ball consistently and sustain drives. So we're going to take the total number of first downs that we earned and then um, – divide that by the number of drives that we had available 
and then that average is going to be uh, over 1.7 or higher. We're operating pretty cleanly. One turnover or less, can we take care of the football? Uh, the next one scores 75% inside the, the red zone. Can we finish drives inside the red zone? And finally, the 12% rule. I've seen Noel Mazzoni use it. I'm pretty sure he's taken it from somewhere else, but we stole it from him. But uh, typically, these are the things that drive kill, and these are the things that are devastating to drives. Fumbles, sacks, penalties, drops, INTs. And typically, we divide the sum of those over the amount of plays that we have. And we want that number to be ideally under 12%. So that typically will mean, did we operate cleanly? Did we, did we you know, execute as an offense? So those four questions, I feel like if we take care of those four things, typically good things are going to happen. Yardage, points, wins, those things will all take care of itself. Um, you know, with my time with Vass and with my time at Bosco, I don't think we've ever lost a game where we've gone three out of four uh, in our goals. You know, typically if you're three for four, four for four, four in your goals, typically good things are going to be happening. Um, two, for two, uh, two for four, you know, it gets a little bit hairy. And then one for four is definitely going to be, you know, rough for you to win that game. So if you take a look, our one loss this year was versus the modern day. Uh, one for four, didn't take care of business. Uh, three turnovers, 20% uh, inside the red zone. That's where we, we really lost the game. Two turnovers inside the red zone. Can't, can't hack it there. And 70% operating, it's not going to work. So you can see as we played the second time around, you know, we're two for four, clean some things up. Like to see some better, you know, ball security you know, put one more touchdown in there inside the red zone and uh, we'll be in a better shape. So these four things I think really measure um, your goals. There's a lot of times you could hit yardage or points measures, but not necessarily play a good game because you did some of these things, you fumbled, you turn over the football, you maybe didn't finish every opportunity inside. So some, some more, um, you know, process-based things to, to measure your outcome. All right. So the next thing is your self scout. I'm going to break this down into two different categories. Uh, your, basically your self-efficiency and then your tendencies of what defenses are going to scout for you. So for ourselves, we're using this to um, take a look at how efficient we are in situations. So this is pretty standard. A lot of people may have seen this before, but typically on first down, you know, we're looking for about four yards or, or more on first down to stay on down a distance schedule. Um, typically we should be about 60% of these um, should be a go and we should be positive on, over four yards on about 60% of those plays. Uh, second down, we're looking to get half the yardage at about 50%. And obviously third and fourth down, we're gonna convert. Uh, if there's a four down territory where we're going for it on fourth and we know that, I'll treat the third down like a second down type situation because typically I'll call it in that manner, in that fashion. Uh, just a, a, another interesting thought is just the thought process on second down. I've changed this from year to year. You know, there's gonna be some years where you don't want to be in third down. You, you might want to take a little more chances on second down to get yourself out of third and fourth down. So that number to me is sometimes dictated on what type of team you are. You know, if you're a ground and pound, you're going to get, you know, four yards in a cloud of dust. Hey, let's get half the yardage right there. But, you know, if you're explosive offense that, you know, can, can get some more opportunities to, to move the chains and have two opportunities to go get that first down, you know, you might want to treat that second down a little bit differently. So that's something to think about as you decide, you know, what's going to work for you and your, your team. So, um, you know, what this is telling us, our situational efficiency. So we're really trying to problem solve and we're trying to let, take a look and inform uh, how we're going to practice. You know, if we're terrible in the red zone and our efficiency numbers show that, you know, that can give us more information of what we need to practice more. Maybe, you know, we're deficient in these type of plays, which, which stalls us out in the red zone. Uh, maybe we're not phenomenal in blitz pickup and, you know, we're getting crushed by blitzes in third down. You know, as you make these cutups and you see the plays that are inefficient, you could pull those into clips and you can watch those cutups and really diagnose what the issue is and, and fix some of those problems within your practice and how you game plan and how you approach your week from, from, from game to game here. So, uh, One thing that you also will, will really discover as you go through this process is um, what do you need to run more? Who needs to touch the ball more? You know, a lot of times you'll go through it and, and you'll see a certain player is electric. You'll see a certain scheme, a certain concept is, is going to be crushing people. You know, a certain run by front, a certain pass by coverage is going to be explosive. And a lot of times you'll run some things and maybe it, it kind of gets lost in, in, in the process of, of a game and you go back and look at it and, You'll, you'll realize, wow, I really missed, you know, some, uh, some yardage and some points and some good stuff out of a given concept or, you know, a certain player touching the ball. 
So this helps to keep uh, accountability for yourself to make sure that you're, you're running the best stuff that you can run and, and you're putting your best foot forward. Um, it also takes a look at, you know, what you need to examine and really, um, you know, especially early on in the year when you're trying to figure out your identity and you're, and you're running a bunch of stuff and putting stuff on film, as you get a couple games in your belt, you're really going to figure out, you know, do I need to work it or do I need to cut it? You know, is it something that, hey, we can fix it? Is it something that we need, you know, down the road to beat that team on your schedule that, that you need to beat? Or, you know, is it something that, hey, we should scrap it because we're taking reps away from the stuff that we should be banking our base offense, stuff that we should get more reps of versus everything. So this helps to really keep, a, you know, some guardrails and, and to keep a coordinator focused and make sure that you're not over the map, you know, when you're installing plays and, and running, uh, running stuff in, in a week-by-week -week basis. It helps to really uh, hone in everything as you get further along your season. Your package gets more and more tight and um, more and more focused on what you need to be running. Hey, Lo. Yep. Can you throw up that uh, goal chart with the first down efficiency 12% rule again real quick? This one right here? Uh, yeah, that one. Yeah. Is that and what you're that, looking for, Coach uh, yeah. Wondrow? And once again, I'll share my email address and, and all the uh, Twitter stuff. You guys can feel free to hit me up, DM me, email me, and I'll share the stuff with you guys. So I got we the also files. Used it Clovis too for yeah. our, well, I did for the defense, and um, it's we had what is it four goals per side of the ball, so we had twelve yep. goals. Yep. We had four on D, four on O, and four on special teams. Um, very, very good. Mike Perotti chimed in too. It's a great chart. I've seen a lot of stuff. Sorry, I'll get out of your way, Stephen. No, all good. I've seen a lot of stuff over the years. This boils it down. I think defense was chaos, uh, points per game. Um, Takeaways, right? Drawing a blank. I don't know. Yep. It doesn't matter. This is offense. You guys are <laughs> shit anyway, so I'll get off. Thanks, Coach. Hold on. Should I, should I get my visor out or something like that or what? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So the next thing is our tendency cell scout. Um, so now this, we're kind of shifting gears to, you know, what, what tendencies are we laying out there? What are things that defenses are going to look at um, at us and what things are we possibly tipping away? So just some things that we, we take a look at um, personnel groupings, you know, by each personnel group, you know, what is your run pass ratio? What are your top concepts? Some things that um, you can take into account there uh, by formation. So top, you know, pass and run concepts by formation. And the biggest thing here as you're looking through the cutoffs is are you tipping anything away? Are you giving anything away? You know, is a, is a slot receiver going on for a certain amount of routes? And, and, and you know, is there a split tip off? Or are you guys squeezing some splits or, or getting really tight together when you're only running certain concepts? Um, you know, what are some things you're doing within the formations that are going to give that defense, you know, a, a tell and a tip to, to cheat and, and, uh, and try to take away something? Uh, same thing along the lines of back set. I know so many teams game punting you on how you set your back. It's going to be really important for you to examine uh, not only, you know, what do you do when you're strong or weak to a tight end away from the tight end to the field, you know, to the boundary, but what type of depth are you, are you having and are you giving away anything within those back sets? So, um, you know, as you take a look at, at those cutups, you know, trying to make sure that, you know, especially your running back coach or whoever's in charge of the run game, making sure that you're not tipping away like outside zone and inside zone or, you know, inside and outside pass, uh, trying to make sure that there's, there's as much consistency as possible there. Uh, field zone, uh, we, you know, we, we break it up into these categories, into backed up. So this is basically uh, in the negative 10 to negative uh, one. Free wheeling is basically the open zone to, from the 20-yard uh, line so you hit the, the red zone. Um, the fringe is just outside the red zone, so just about 35 to 25. And then red zone, um, 25, and we break it all the way down uh, inside to the five and the goal line is anything under the five and then down in distance um, we're going to break down you know by each of those downs there uh, typically i break the yardage in third and fourth down by one and two for short mediums three to five long six to nine and xl is 10 plus and finally the hit chart you know are we are we running behind a certain offensive lineman you know are, are we throwing to a certain receiver on, on on the field or boundary side left or right uh, some things to keep, keep an account there for. So all the information comes at you and it's, it's all great. There's a ton of numbers and a ton of things for you to look at. And, um, you know, part of this is um, it, it can be negative for a coordinator. You can see a lot of things and have tendencies and freak out about trying to chase ghosts and, uh, you know, really try to protect those tendencies with 
maybe not calling something or, or focusing your, your efforts somewhere else. But really, it's, it's information to feed your decisions moving forward. And it's not so much of just trying to hide, just hide your tendencies. And that's all you're trying to do. You know, it's good to, to have tendencies. You know, bad offenses don't have tendencies. You know, if you can't hang your hat on anything, that's necessarily a good thing. You know, if you, if you run 15 different run schemes, how good are you at all 15 of those run schemes? If you run 20 different pass schemes, you know, how good can you be at any one of those concepts? So it's more about, hey, we know what our tendencies are. We know what our top concepts are. And really what you're trying to do is you're trying to build constraint plays. So, you know, I kind of go back to, you know, series-based football. You know, are, are you going to have enough answers to take away things that teams are going to use to, you know, basically overplay your top plays? You know, so if you are playing power, you know, what are your answers to if they spill your edge and, and you know, take everything to the sideline? You know, could it be, you know, pin and pull? Could it be, you know, some sort of outside zone variation, whatever it may be, whatever fits your scheme, but just having things that you can practice and, and having protocols built in within your play calling system to where, you know, you have answers for if they do something with their front, they blitz, uh, if they drop everybody in coverage or if they, if they cover you up in man coverage. So really that, those are the four answers of things that you really have to have answers to within your top plays in, in the run game and in the pass game. So I'll take this moment and see if there's any questions here. Vass, you want to help me out real quick? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I do not see anything right now. You're good. Perfect. All right. So now moving on. So into our opponent scout, um, going to talk about how we break down opponents, how we game plan, and how we break it up within our staff. So the first part of breaking down, um, you know, Vass and I really worked on this a couple years ago together and uh, really built something pretty cool. Uh, you know, I was tired of seeing his, you know, 1982 TCU film, you know, intermixed with my stuff. And it was really Very tough to, <laughs> it was really tough to, to get everything organized. So stuff's just cluttered and it's all over the place. So one of the things we did is we just created folders um, for each opponent. And it sounds silly, it sounds stupid, but it just makes your world and makes your life so much easier. You know, so here, you know, you have your, your opponent, De La Salle High School, and then you have your, your special teams folder, you have your defensive school folder, you have your offensive folder. So all you do is you just go into your – make a schedule, make a practice game, and then you basically fill in, you know, a, a column for each category that you need. So for us, we like to have one clean place to have the scouting report where the kids can go click through first and immediately know where the scouting report is, uh, the exact games we want them to see, uh, formation, front stunt, blitz cutups, coverage cutups, situational, and then our meeting cutups. So just one place for everything just to be organized just so you can have everything in the right place. Everyone's on the same page. Um, your players, your coaches, everyone knows where to find the film. Uh, typically we're going to do this before we start any of our breakdowns and we'll have this all ready for uh, our coaches when they come in for the meeting and our players obviously when they come in on Monday. So choosing the right games for breakdown, uh, really it's, it's, a, it's, a tough, it's a tough job sometimes. I mean, if you don't play in a league where there's a lot of, uh, you know, ideas kind of trickle down from one team to the next, you know, sometimes it can be tough. So, you know, really you want to find a team that has a similar style to you and uh, you know, does their playing style match what you do? You know, is there, um, are the defensive answers that you're going to get, you know, from your opponent going to be similar to what they're giving the other teams that they're playing on their schedule? You know, do you have similar personnel groupings, same formation, same motions, and then uh, trying to get as many concepts ideas as possible. And sometimes, this may not match the personnel group or the formation, but you can see how uh, a Mike backer is going to push on a back. You know, you can see how, um, you know, an outside linebacker is going to wall a vertical route. And it may happen in two by two, four open, you know, the same way that I would with the tight end, you know, close on the opposite side. So you have to kind of get creative sometimes if you don't have great film to work here. But really you're trying to get, you know, the route stems, your run concepts, you know, the, the angles of departure that people are leaving out and the reactions of the defense that are going to be hopefully be similar to that. And sometimes you're going to have to be creative and you're going to have to supplement from other places and bring other clips in and just bring in, you know, just enough just to fill everything in. Um, for us, typically we're on average about four to five games in our breakdown and then maybe one or two extra games supplemented in, but only a certain, you know, formation or a certain personnel grouping, you know, if we're lacking it from the four games or five games that we chose. So it's not a perfect science. I don't have an answer for you every single week, but 
it's kind of what we do to, to where we get enough information to, to break down. Uh, here's the data points that we break down. And I'm only going to talk about a couple of them. Um, personnel, I feel like this is huge. Uh, you know, this is one thing that I've asked, you know, preached to me uh, early and often. Teams are going to give you different personnel packages depending on what you're in. So if you're in, like Oklahoma is running 21 personnel for wide stuff, and that's going to look a lot different than your team that's going to be sitting in 10 personnel for open, for wide. So that's one thing that's going to be huge. So whatever team your defense is playing, your opponent's playing, that offense, you're going to want to tag that personnel grouping. Uh, the back sets, so many blitzes, fronts, so many teams are going to set uh, a lot of their pressures, a lot of their fronts off of your back, especially if you don't play with a ton of tight ends. So just checking, you know, if they're to the field, to the boundary, to a tight end, to away from tight end, uh, or whatever back sets that you use. Um, fronts, blitzes, and coverages. Uh, the biggest thing is um, before we get too deep into our, um, our breakdowns, we try to get into a common language. Uh, I try to use whatever defense, um, wherever high school I'm at. Like when I was at uh, Sarah with Vass, I was typically trying to use as much of their language as possible to communicate it just so that um, – you know, scout looks were, were consistent. Scout looks were easy. We can just basically so you could say, cheat during practice. Yeah. Yeah. So we can say, uh, we can say money, money, money. And, and yeah. So you could make calls that our defenders would make and try to influence them. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't tell our quarterback to do that. So no, just, you know, yeah, I'm giving him the, the freedom to, to learn. So <laughs> anyways, uh, game planning, three things, uh, KYP, uh, know your opponent and process. And, uh, you know, Sun Tzu, Art of War, basically know your enemy, know yourself, and typically you're going to be in good shape. If you know one but not the other, you're going to struggle. And if you know neither, you're, you're not going to do well at all. So this is kind of the, the, the guide and, and everything that the root of, of my game planning, uh, it goes into, you know, knowing you know, yourself and your opponent. So the first thing that drives everything we do is, you know, who are we? You know, what do we do well? Who's our playmakers? You know, what are the schemes that, that are going to really highlight what we do well? And then you're trying to match that as closely to what you're getting defensively uh, in, a, in a given week. And really this is talked about a lot, but I mean, this, this is that important. I mean, it really is. I mean, a lot of times, you know, scheme, you know, when it doesn't fit the person that you have, you know, might put your players in a bad position and, and you might not maximize, might hold them back from, from really achieving and really doing well. Uh, knowing your opponent, so uh, the main things we're trying to find out is uh, what is their overall defensive philosophy? So, you know, what, what, how do they feel about pressure? How do they feel about coverage? Uh, what's their personality on disguises? You know, so you're trying to find some of those things uh, within a course of a game that's going to help you figure out, you know, what are they going to do? You're trying to predict the futures and how they're going to react in the future when things get tough. So, um, you know, you're looking at a cut up of what they give up consistently and how do they adjust within, within a game here. And then um, within the personnel packages, uh, this is one thing that really helps cutting down the learning process. You know, if you know, you know, what personnel is in and you know what they do within that personnel grouping, you can cut the learning curve down because now you're not having to practice versus everything. You know, in their base package, they're going to be in two fronts, two coverages, you know, in these situations. Well, you can focus your practice for that week on those exact looks. You know, if you know, you know, they're in the nickel and the dime package and they run this front, this coverage, this blitz, you know, it helps to get as many reps within the stuff that, that they know and they love. And hopefully you'll practice enough of the, of the variations where you'll be prepped for the things that you've seen on film and scouted for. And it doesn't always work out. I mean, you have to have a contingency and you have to have uh, an answer for when, when teams abandon it, but you got to start from somewhere and, and you can't chase ghosts forever. You have to start and anchor yourself down somewhere. Uh, and then initially, um, you know, we're really going to be working hard to grade the strength and weaknesses of the personnel. So who's in, what do they do well, and what don't they do well? So that's one of the biggest things that we'll work in film study, and I'll get to that here in a second. Um, within the structure, you're taking a look at, you know, front, so, you know, pressures, coverage, uh, and where in each one of those is applied. Um, and this is broken down. Typically, I'm going to have, you know, our front guys, our O-line coaches, uh, our backs looking at, the fronts and pressures, and then typically our backing guys will be looking at coverage, obviously, and we'll be piecing all that together. Um, so uh, it's kind of the timeline of how we do this. You know, after we select the films and we tag everything, uh, what I like to do first is just um, just let the film run. And, and I'm going to do this typically on my own on either Friday night or Saturday morning right after I finish a grading. 
uh, I just want to get to know the DC a little bit. I want to know how he reacts in certain situations. And uh, I'm not stopping. I'm not pausing a ton. But basically, I just want to get a flow of the game and, and kind of see how, you know, coordinator racks to a game. Uh, I think it's really healthy to, to see this because uh, a lot of times when you get into the cut-ups, you can get really stuck in on, you know, the minutia, what's in there without seeing the big picture. And just having the big picture in mind can help you frame your reference when you get back into those specific cut-ups of, you know, situational football. And that's when you get to know the nuts and bolts a little bit better. But with having that overall, you know, global view of what that coordinator is like, what that defense is like, it can give some reference to, to the cut-ups that you take. So that's kind of the 30,000 foot view before we go into the targeted look of, you know, here's the exact formation, the situations, um, and what their, what their structures are in each one of those situations. So, uh, you know, the first initial look is, is we're trying to figure out, you know, why are they in their packages? You know, what would trigger somebody to jump into, you know, their heavy package or nickel package? You know, what personnel groups, uh, where in the field do they play at? What down distances, um, you know, you're really trying to, to narrow that down so you can cut down the installation in the week and really refine what you're trying to do. Uh, diving into the packages, uh, what we'll do is we'll study the, the cut-ups initially um, by personnel group and by formation. And then situationally in these situations, down distance, field zone, and if we have, you know, sometimes time is not always shown on film, we'll have those. And then we'll break down pressures by package and coverage by package. You know, we'll watch those cut-ups uh, in, our, in our box meeting and then in our back-end meeting with the receivers and the quarterback coaches. Uh, one thing you can try to do as much as possible is try to draw, draw, draw. I mean, it's one of the, the best ways that you can learn and really pick up the defenses that you're seeing in the given week. Because after you've drawn the scout cards, you've, you've drawn up, you know, all the, the looks on your eight boxes, you know, you can really get to see uh, pre-snap looks and what that's going to indicate post-snap on game day a little bit faster. So it just helps the learning curve for yourself as a coordinator or as a, as a position coach. So uh, when we gauge the personnel strengths and weaknesses, these are the areas that we're looking at. Um, D-line-wise, we're looking at what's their get-off like, how physical are they, you know, how well do they shed blocks and finish. And then you're analyzing what their pass rush style and, and what their top moves are. Uh, linebacker play, how well they play stuff downhill, how well do they play things side to side, and how well do they actually finish plays. Uh, within the pass coverage, what's their range like, how well do they transition and cover in space, and then um, you know, can they actually play the ball. And then DB-wise, you know, how physical are they in both run and pass, you know, how well do they use their hands and finish tackles. Uh, I think this is one important thing within the pass game is – you know, you're looking at not just press and off man coverage, but can they actually play the ball? You know, is it something that, you know, they are, they're in great coverage and they're in phase, but you know, do they, do they finish on play? Do they actually break up passes? Do they, do they actually take away footballs? I mean, a lot of times you'll see guys are covered, you know, in, in, a, in a look here, but when that ball goes up in the air, you know, if you have that matchup, you know, that defensive back is not necessarily able to make that play. That's one thing that, that we always kind of make sure we take a look and see who actually has that capability of finishing. Uh, one thing uh, Vass taught me, and, and I learned a lot from him, is, is about split field coverage. So when we break down our coverages, we try to break it down into compartments. And uh, one thing we do is we divide that coverage in half. And really what we're trying to figure out is how do they play surfaces? So on the strong side of their coverage, you know, how would they play a, a one receiver, a two receiver, a three receiver set? And then how would they play uh, our formation adjustments? That's one thing we're really taking a look at because a lot of teams will have the same rules for three by one with open and closed sets. So you want to get the three by one checks and figure out what that is and figure out where your open grass and where, where your matchups and where your space is. Um, within trips, we further break it down and I really want to see how are they uh, playing our actual trips look. So, you know, are they trying to combo, you know, two people and cut somebody loose in man to coverage or, or are they trying to play zone? Or what are they trying to do? So where are their combos? So say, for instance, you know, everyone's stubby coverage. Are they, are they man on number one and playing, you know, that, that, that two read palms look on, on two and three? You know, are they borrowing somebody from the backside to help out for trips? You know, are they leaving somebody ISO on the inside and comboing one and two? So you know, that's one thing we're really taking a look at in trips and trying to break it down even further just to cut the learning down. Because when we teach it to our quarterbacks, we just say, hey, all this is right here is it's palms on the inside. Treat it like how you would have palms if the, if the outside receiver didn't exist. 
So it cuts down some of the learning or, or, you know, if it's another coverage, we would break it down that way, but um, trying to take a look in pieces and, and see how things fit together. Uh, you know, I listened to Dub's talk earlier and I really love what he does with uh, defining space and, and, and defining pre-snap looks. So we do the same thing within defining our box. You know, so we're definitely going to look at that hard deck set at seven yards um, to define, you know, who's deep, who's short, and then look at those apex lines between the slot receiver and the tackles or the first eligible receiver and the tackles and see who's playing the box, who's playing the flat space right there. Uh, and really trying to get some pre-snap looks to see, you know, numbers wise in the run game and the pass game, you know, where are they taking it away? So that's one thing I love that he does. And, and you know, I, I took it and definitely ran with it in, in my own practice and what we've been doing. And uh, what it really helps us is it really helps, you know, taking a look at what's easy right off the get go and then taking a look at people's stances, their eyes and their alignment, you know, what their intentions could be post snap and how this can affect you in a post snap world. So that's one thing you definitely have to account for. You can't just live strictly in a pre-snap world because people will set the rat, you know, they'll get the, the, the rats and cheese and they'll, they'll go and set the trap and, and, and capture that rat. So you know, the biggest thing is making sure you have a, a way to process that information post-snap so it all matches up. Uh, we break down our coverages in three categories. So when we're looking at teams, we're really trying to decide, you know, are they a straight man team? Or are they trying to straight up zone spot drop and play different windows or are they trying to match us you know are they going to go ahead and play zone and, and match somebody up and run with them man to man and what this does it, it specifically teaches us um what type of style what type of approach we need to have in our run game so you know in man and a lot of match defenses you're not going to get open windows to throw to so when you're you know, working on you know your route separation and running your, your routes and you're teaching your quarterbacks to throw they're going to have open shoulders they're not going to have uncontested footballs if someone's going to be in their hip pocket, no one's going to be running, you know, free. You're going to have to throw and, and lead that receiver into the open space on time. And, and our receivers are going to understand where they are in the progression and uh, what type of timing they have to work their release and to get into open windows. And then straight zone coverage, if you're getting a spot drop, you know, it's not going to be the same. It, it could be a huge, huge uh, adjustment because if you're just used to throwing to match defenses and all of a sudden you get guys that are spot dropping in the windows, it's a big adjustment for a quarterback, even though, you know, you would think initially it's not, but if you're used to throwing in one style and you're not training your quarterback to throw in both styles, it can be really, really rough to adjust from one to the next. So here's some of the questions we're trying to answer in man coverage. All we want to know is, you know, where's their support, where's their help. So where are they trying to, you know, add defenders a cheat and take away are the windows, um, you know, are they bracketing somebody? Uh, do they play different techniques if they have, you know, bracket or help? So that, that's what we're trying to see. Where can we isolate people to get our one-on-one -on -one matchups back again? Uh, what type of pressure is coming with it? And then how do they handle stressful formations and man coverage? So when we condense, uh, when we stack, when we bunch, you know, what would their adjustments be? Uh, in zone coverage, we want to see if we can grab guys. We want to see how we can affect uh, their eyes. It's definitely one thing. Uh, how physical are their underneath coverages? You know, what plans do we need to have when we clear through level two? Uh, with our routes, um, you know, how to, uh, how to splits and, and how to, how to um, different formations affect, you know, where their eyes go or who they pass off things to. And finally in the match uh, world is, um, you know, how do they play different, you know, route tree and route stems? Um, you know, if, if, how would their passing rules, how the rules work to, to see who passes things off. Uh, one thing that's huge that, that I, I think we're, we're really going to work to in the next world uh, when we see more match teams is, you know, how are they going to account for that running back? You know, so many teams are bracketing slot receivers and, and, and doubling those easy throws. You know, they're going to have to bust somebody loose. So typically you're going to get, you know, maybe some outside receivers on one-on-ones and typically some running backs on one-on-ones. So, you know, how do they adjust for routes, the backfield, you know, with him running stuff vertically, stuff to the flats? Uh, how, do, how would they pass those things off and how do they communicate that stuff? Uh, in our fronts, uh, we break things down into three general categories and, um, you know, first step is, is, you know, are they in the even front? You know, is our center uncovered? You know, are they in the odd front where our center is covered? Or then some sort of bare variation where all three interior alignment are covered. So we start there first. And then when we go into our run game meeting or we go into um, our pass protection meeting, we're talking about uh, what linebackers would we have to target to, to block. And then on the quarterback receiver side, what would we need to take care of to take care of, uh, of that extra 
player that's going to fill into that box post now. So if you are seeing, you know, 10 personnel, you're seeing a seven man box, you can only block five of them. You know, so how, how would you be able to block the five and account for the other guys uh, within, you know, your box that can be playing the run. So we'll do that. And, and that's how the, the two will, will mesh together and blend. So what we're trying to do is you're trying to consolidate the amount of learning that we're, our guys are going to have, because typically if they're in one of those three categories, it's not going to change, you know, who you're targeting to up front with your defensive line. You know, you're just have to do some homework to make sure that you're targeting to the correct backers, you know, drop down, roll down safeties, et cetera. And then um, as we get that information and if we tag everything, we'll, we'll start off with our box meeting first. Uh, typically we'll start off with our run game to really build off of that first. Um, you know, we'll, we'll break it down by our top personnel groups and formations to get our top run plays and concepts going. And uh, typically what we'll do is we'll do our defender boss count, see where guys are loaded up or short, and uh, we'll set our targeting for that. And, and then what we really want to find out is a couple of questions. You know, how are they going to play the edges? So are they a box team that's going to put everything back inside and turn everything back in, or are they going to spill runs and turn everything out to the sideline? You know, their D-line technique, you know, are they one gap, two gap guys? You know, are they going to be guys that are going to be playing um, like some sort of lag technique? Are they, are they good at splitting double teams? Um, you know, what are we seeing from those guys? Uh, linebackers, you know, how do they feel? Are they one gap? Go ahead and fill it and run throughs. Uh, are they going to be, uh, how are they reacting to polars and how, how are they, you know, communicating that? Uh, do they track the running back and, and gaps aren't as important? You know, really what we're trying to see is um, how they're reacting to that. And then pass pro, you know, really what we're trying to get there is um, what's their blitz personality. So are they a team that's going to show uh, and mug up their, their pressures and just blitz? Are they going to bluff a lot of pressures? Are they going to, you know, blitz from depth? Are they going to show you something early and blitz opposite? We're trying to get some patterns and some things that, that we can possibly get to inform our, our pass projection. Um, are there body language tip away and giveaways? You know, one thing we do is, you know, we'll give snapshots to our guys of what their base zone coverage looks like, their base man coverage, what that body language of that linebacker would be, and then um, what that body language would be like when they're blitzing. So you can get a lot of tips and tells of, um, you know, guys giving away certain things just based on how they're standing and how they're trying to disguise. And then uh, initially, where are they blitzing from? So we'll run a report and check out, you know, what indicator are they giving us blitz-wise and what are the numbers like? And, and we'll go into those cutups to see if it matches what we're doing. And then stunts and cutups, and we're really taking a look at the types and situations where they're utilizing stunts. So they're using run stunts, or are they going to be more pass stunts, and, and uh, what we are going to be getting for that. Uh, for our pass game meeting, uh, we'll be working through our formation cutup first. Uh, we're really looking at our top coverages that we're seeing by our formations. And uh, again, the type of coverage it is for each one. And then, um, you know, what, what issues are they having? Are they having something where uh, something scheme-wise is, is a problem? You know, is there someone with bad eyes that's giving up something consistently? Uh, is there someone that's getting beat one-on-one -on -one consistently? You know, what are some things that you can take advantage of easy and early? Um, initially, we're trying to build our base concepts for their top coverages. So initially, you know, if they're, they're running, you know, two coverages initially, that's our, our base plays that we're repping on that week are going to be working on that. And we'll have tags and we'll have things that we'll have for adjustments in our back pocket, ready to go for secondary coverages that we've seen uh, in, in apical formations and personnel groupings. And then we're trying to predict whatever possible defensive answers we can get. So, you know, one mistake I made early on was, you know, say for instance, we're not seeing a ton of, of blitz or cover zero, you know, and we didn't practice it early on. All of a sudden you see it in the game, you haven't practiced it for, you know, two, three weeks and you can get exposed and, and it can be, it can be night, night for you. But, um, you know, one thing is to try to plan in, um, you know, some times and some periods to where you get some contingency work to where you may not get a lot, a lot of cover zero, but you may have to work it a little bit in some periods, maybe some half line periods or um, a couple reps in seven on seven or, or some teamwork where, you know, you are getting some coverages that are contrary to what you're, you're preparing for. And then finally, situational, um, we're dropping in some ideas to see what they're doing in third down, red zone, and goal line. And typically, I won't get to this breakdown until later in the week because typically on the weekend, we're trying to get our base stuff in, and um, we're trying to meet on all that stuff and get that plan finalized. And then as we go through the practice week, we'll go into these each situations in our meetings, our installs, our game plan will all be focused on that, and our practice and our team periods will all be focused on those periods. I'll go through that in a second.
Uh, one important thing that I, I think I learned as a play caller early on is I think initially you have way too much on a call sheet. And uh, I think initially um, you, you think you need to be in these situations a ton, but when you take a look at it, you're not really in some of the situations as many times as you think. So, you know, if you have like five or six calls in third and short, and you're really only in that situation, you know, two times, how many calls do you really need? How many calls do you need to really be working on? So initially, as we're working on that, we're trying to put a limit on some of these situations. So, you know, say for instance, on first down, you're going to have typically, you know, eight to 15 drives within the game. So, you know, we typically aim for about 10 to 12 first down openers and P and 10 openers. So, you know, trying to make sure that you're not going overboard on, you know, over preparing and over planning for situations is tough because as a coach, you always want to make sure that you have enough, but it's an art sometimes to make sure that you're not going overboard and um, not maximizing your time and not really getting quality reps and the stuff that you really need to be good at. So that's one thing I really um, learned over the years is, is I made that mistake and, and didn't really have a home. So uh, here's our call sheet inventory. So as we build things together, uh, we have these little areas to where uh, we can see like, all right, in this package, our two by two formation, you know, how many plays do we have within our run game? How many plays do we have in our quick game, our drop back, our screens, our PO tags, et cetera to make sure that we have a balanced um, game plan and we're not going overboard and too much. So, you know, say for instance, we have like 20 calls in our, in our run game section here. Well, we probably need to pare this down and, and take a look at what we really need. So it helps you to kind of keep uh, a, an account of what you're putting in these situations. So you're not overkilling it and going overboard. Our staff responsibilities. Um, what we're doing here is, um, you know, typically the, the game plan, the scouting report, uh, the ideas are all coming from these position groups. So we're trying to divide the work up as much as possible. Uh, I've been in both situations. I, I, I'm blessed to be in a situation where I have a phenomenal staff that allows me to, to give them a lot of work and, and delegate a lot of that to where a lot can get done. And I've been on the other side where basically it's been one to two guys doing the, the majority of the work. And, um, you know, there, there's some things you're going to have to cut, honestly. So really each situation is going to be different and, and your situation can, can definitely vary, but um, you know, typically what I've done is from the from the upfront stage, you know, we're going to allow the O line coaches to assess their fronts and pressures, um, help devise a plan, all the run game ideas, uh, and, and also build a scattering report. So they're going to look and build a personnel scattering report on their defensive line. Uh, our tight end coaches are definitely going to look at the edges, look at secondary force, um, also build in run game ideas, and then have ideas within. Know, RPOs and play actions, and then the scouting report they'll do uh, typically the, the linebackers and, and uh, overhangs. Um, our running backs will also help out within the inside linebackers, assessing their technique in the run game, and specifically uh, seeing how they play different blocks. You know, so say for instance, how would they play power versus zone versus outside zone? So what would their what would their run technique be on all of those? So that when they go back to their meetings and meet with the running backs, they can start to to go over how, you know, you're expected defense to react to different run schemes. Um, you're also helping out with the pass pro plan, run game ideas, situational run, and then they're building their scouting report as well. And then from the receiver and the quarterback positions, we're looking at the back end from the safeties and corners, specifically seeing, uh, you know, what coverage, what personnel that they're going to use for each coverage, uh, and then what their technique is for each one of those. And then finally, I want to go into uh, the practice prep. So actually taking your ideas that you've worked so hard on all weekend and actually applying it to the week. So the first thing I want to talk about is our scouting report, and we'll go into how we, we present it in meetings and then how we apply it to practice. So our scouting report is all done on huddle. Uh, we try to put it all in one spot. And uh, one thing we try to do is we try to refine it to where it's not overkill. So we want to make sure that we're really uh, thoughtful and uh, really deliberate with the type of film that we're showing to our guys. So they're, they're more likely to watch it and be directly focused to what they need if you chop up the film that they need to see. So taking the cut-ups that they need to see to prove your point. It really only takes about two to three, you know, cut-ups of film in order for them to see it. And then you can direct them to see more cut-ups for those guys that are going to go out there and definitely watch a lot more film and guys that should be watching more film. But at least a bare minimum with the scouting report that we build, they should have a good idea of what they should be seeing. So uh, first thing we'll do is we'll talk about our strengths and weaknesses of our opponents. You know, who are they? You know, uh, you know, how to study the opponent. So really, you know, what cut-ups should you be watching? 
and, and when should you be watching it to get ready for practice? So just a quick slide of just like, hey, on Monday, these should be the, the things you should check off your watch list. Tuesday, these should be the things you check off your watch list and so on and so forth. And so however your install works in the given week, guide their study so that they know, you know what's in store for the week. Um, and then within the strengths and weaknesses, some quick points and some quick tips to, to kind of set the frame and, and set the mentality for the week. You know, what type of game is this gonna be? Who are you facing? Um, within our scouting report, we try to build, um, you know, film into it. And I, I don't draw a ton of stuff on huddle and upload it into it. It's just, you know, it's, it's a pretty rough process sometimes. But um, what we do is just show the film, pause it where you wanna pause it, and you circle, notate, and do everything you would do on a drawing, because this is what they're gonna be seeing on game day anyways. So say for instance, you want to communicate, hey, this is their bracket coverage. You know, hey, they're talking right here, they're communicating the bracket. There's the outside leverage and the safety low and shaded towards that receiver. That's a quick way just to, to give that information to your kids to where you're not just spending a ton of time just drawing things, you know, on Visio and then uploading it, which takes forever onto Excel and onto Huddle. So just a way to cut that time and, and make it more efficient. Uh, here's our scouting report. So we're gonna build it off of uh, each position group. So for instance, the defensive line right here, you know, you're just trying to give the, the Cliffs notes of what they're going to be seeing for this week. You know, so, you know, who's their best player? Who's their worst player? What are their strengths and weaknesses? What are their top moves and, and tips and tells that you're going to see in that given week? So there'll be one for the defensive line, one for the backers, and then one for the secondary right there. And then we like to give a depth chart and just some basic information for these guys to see so they know who they should be studying in a given week and, uh, you know, what technique – uh, each player is going to have. So they know, hey, I'm the left receiver. This is the left DB. I'm going to be studying this guy all week long, and I'm going to know, you know, what he likes to do and, and what situations we're going to get certain looks at. And then as we get into um, the meeting agenda, so as we go through the actual uh, week right here. So typically uh, on Monday, uh, we'll start off and, and we'll do a uh, previous game wrap-up. So when you saw earlier, our game grade, our 111th, um, our goals, we're gonna go through all that stuff. Uh, typically we'll go through and celebrate our top performers and uh, we'll go over you know, some good, some bad, and some ugly. I think this right here proves a point and you can really send a message to your team as opposed to just watching all 60 clips in order and really just kind of beating a dead horse. You can really you know, prove a point by showing those really great two or three plays, those really terrible two or three plays and the stuff that's unacceptable. You have a guy that's loafing, uh, you have an effort issue. You have a guy that has a personal foul. Let's, let's, put him, let's put him in front of our meeting and make sure that stuff doesn't happen again. And then we're going to move on to our next opponent. So typically is where I'm going to do an overview. So kind of go through the scouting report and fill in details and go into more depth so they can take notes and get more information on that and really want to set the tone and, and let the kids know, hey, well, how are we going to win this week? You know, what do we need to do to do our part? And then finally, we'll break into position meetings where you know position groups want to wrap up the last game they can do so and then go into the actual scouting report and the looks that we have for each day. So by day, uh, Monday is typically going to be our base structure, base first down, second down looks in the open field. So our top runs, our top passes, any new installs going to go on that day. So our film, our meetings, our team periods are all built off of this. Third down on Tuesdays, uh, red zone goal line on Wednesdays, and then uh, flow of the game, which is basically our openers. So how do they start games and how is our opening script going to be uh, looking like that for that? And what, what are we trying to accomplish in our opening script? So planning efficient meetings, uh, I think by segmenting it out and putting it by situation, concept, defense, a specific situation will just help the learning and cut uh, a lot of the, the other stuff that they don't have to worry about. Focus everything within that time and make sure everything is built off of, you know, one, two major situations or concepts for the day. Um, Again, two or three clips, get your point across quickly, and then finally just spread the wealth. I mean, I shouldn't be the one talking all meeting long. I need to ask questions. Guys need to be explaining things. Guys need to be pointing things out on film. Have uh, you know, other players get up and teach and draw and explain to each other. And that just deepens the learning. I've learned more from teaching and explaining things than I ever did uh, just watching as a, as a passive learner. Um, building practice plans. And, um, you know, really what I, what I do first is um, – I'm going to skip forward here, running out of time. You know, building a practice plan around what you're trying to do. Really what I try to do is I build backwards first. So we, we start with what our emphasis for the day. So if our team emphasis is first down, 
uh, our support periods are gonna are gonna build around that. So we're trying to get as many reps of that to support whatever we're calling in that situation. So if our first down situation is there, we'll work backwards and build our skelly periods of seven on seven and inside runs to support that. And um, typically after you do that, it just deepens the learning up and gives our guys as many opportunities to work through a certain scenario and then get a lot of the problems fixed and solved. And then now you come back in meetings and you, you, you correct it and you fix it. Uh, one of the things is try to steal as much time as possible. You know, if guys are standing around or special teams or, you know, if your scout offense is only a certain many guys, we'll pull your guys that aren't in the scout team and pull them back and have them do something. Have them walk back through a period, uh, have them fix mistakes, have them go through and, and rep through the reps of the next period. So guys are getting productive uh, throughout practice. You're not wasting any time. Um, I think I'm about out of time, so I'm not going to go through the scripting process here, but Again, I'll share this stuff with yeah, you guys coach, as well. Wrap it up. Yeah, uh, so here's my information. Um, you can find me on Twitter, Coach Stephen Lowe. My email is the same at Gmail, and that's my cell phone. Yeah, I'm more than happy to answer questions and stick around. I'm definitely going to be watching uh, Coach Mons hereafter. Um, but uh, thanks for having me on, guys, and I uh, hope you guys are staying safe out there. And uh, good luck to you guys this season.